Father, I thank you for your word. I ask that today um, we would really, as we engage with your word, that the power of your word and what you're saying would really connect with our hearts and that um, we would get it. Holy Spirit, that uh, you would open our eyes and our ears to hear what it is that you're saying and that it won't miss us this morning, that we'll actually get it. I pray that it won't simply tickle our ears and trickle off, but, but there would be something of the power of God would take root this morning that would cause change to take place in our lives. I thank you that you've given us the word, that it is power, that every part of it is great for teaching and communicating kingdom truth. And so we thank you and we honour the word of God for not simply words on a page, but it's you speaking to us, instructing us, showing us. And so we say thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, um, we're going to um, carry on in our series. Uh, oh, something's happened. I'm on the wrong page. Just wait. I'll be back. I'm back. Um, we're going to carry on in our series in Luke, but... To get today's passage, we actually need to read it in context of last week. Because if we don't read it in the context of last week, you're kind of going to get half a a deal. And the passage today is a really well-known passage of Scripture, but I also think it's one of the most misunderstood passages of Scripture. When I tell you what it is, you may be surprised. But we're going to read it. And we're going to read it in context. Last week, you'll remember, we talked about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. And that the fact is that many of us kind of, you know, we we love 12 mils from the top of the glass, but fully love God is what the command is. And it's a a full on command. Um, And I was going to say it's not easy. I'd change it. I'd say it's impossible. I remember when I first preached this today's passage, I I was young, girl. And um, we're in Christchurch and I was just kind of getting going, preaching, and it was a night slot. And uh, the night slots were the, exper- uh, the, the experiential, experiment slots. There weren't quite so many people there, so if the preacher made a mess of it, it wasn't quite so catastrophic. Anyway, our passage today is the Good Samaritan. And the first time I preached this passage, I thought, what can I do with a bit of a creative edge that's going to help people remember this passage. And so I racked my brain and then I came up with the idea. I'm going to fall as I take the stage. I'm going to, I'm going to fall up the stairs and I'm just going to stay there on the ground and see who comes and helps me. So I, I was serious. I went down to the church in the afternoon, down to the church building, because you're the church, not the building. I went down to the church building in the afternoon and I practised many, many times falling up the stairs because I wanted it to look genuine. I didn't want it to look fake. There, there is still, I know at least one old lady who is in heaven now and she still has compassion for me because I fell up the stairs when I was going to preach. She felt so bad for me. She came up after and said, I'm so sorry, dear. And, and, and she's a lovely lady. And so... The time came and I hit the stairs and I fell. I'm not doing it today. I'm older and wiser. And I fell and I fell on the stairs and I did such a good job, such a good job. I impressed myself so much that I jumped up. I forgot to lay there. (laughs) And people thought I'd fallen up the stairs and it kind of stuffed the whole thing up. But anyway, um, that was my first ever attempt to communicate what is in this wonderful passage. So we're going to read it, but we're going to read last week's passage as well because, as I said, the context, context is everything in the Scripture. The context is in last week, okay? So here we go. We're starting at Luke, if you want to follow me. Chapter 10, verse 25 through to verse 37, and I'm reading from the NLT. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted, now we're in today's passage, the man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, 
and who is my neighbour? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was travelling from Jerusalem down to Jericho and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. The temple assistant walked over, um, a temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side of the road. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine, and he bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn or a motel, where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. Two silver coins in this culture at this time was enough for two months' accommodation. You put that into the, to today's dollars, let, let's say... Uh, we dropped him, we took him to the Novotel in town. You're talking a lot of money, aren't you? Two months to stay in a, in a motel or a hotel. Um, that's a lot of money. Um, the next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man. If, this, if his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbour to the man who was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now you go and do the same. Jesus is cutting again right through all the pretense of this religious expert, religious law, lawyer, and uh, who's actually wanting to trip Jesus up. This isn't just a, a comfortable conversation. where th This guy is trying to throw questions at Jesus to trip him up. They're actually trying to get him to blaspheme so that they can um, legally crucify him. That's what they're trying to do. But Jesus doesn't do that. And Jesus gets through all the pretense and he goes again to the heart of the issue. Disciple, do. That's what Jesus said here, eh? Go and do that again. Go and do that. So disciples about doing or being devout, or is it? That's my question among others today. Is it? I'll let you off the hook. The answer is yes, it is. But is it? There's more to it than that. James 1.22 says this, But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourself. James 2.14 says, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? How can this kind of faith save or heal, same word, anyone? The key to the passage is the context. Do you remember what the context is? Because I don't know about you, but I've heard all sorts. I've probably preached all sorts of things from the old Samaritan story, the good Samaritan. I don't know how old he was. I've got old on the brain. He's um, the good Samaritan. Uh, the key is the context, and the context is in last week's passage, and the context is this. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him a question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? That is the point of this passage. That is the context of this passage is a question. That's what Jesus is addressing right through to the end of the Good Samaritan. He's addressing this question. And often we overlook that. It's easy, a parable, it's easy to get a parable wrong. A parable is a story making a point. Jesus used parables all the time, but there is generally one point in a parable. We like to pull them apart and they are filled with, with uh, gems. You know, you can pull them apart and you can look in there and go, my goodness, it's full of all this stuff. It's absolutely amazing and it's good and it's useful to teach and all those kind of things. But there is always one point, one overriding point or principle in a parable that Jesus is trying to communicate. So the question to ask is, in this case, 
What's Jesus actually trying to say to this guy? Is it? What is it? So I did the normal. Even as I started to prepare, I threw myself into the symbolism. Let's look into the symbolism because there's so much symbolism in this parable. It's amazing. Like the oil, put the oil on him and the wine on him. The oil means like in the Bible, it stands for prosperity and stability and joy and health and wisdom and readiness for Christ's return and peace. It's talking of curing or being made whole. It speaks of the Holy Spirit um, and the anointing. When you get to wine, wine's talking about covenant blessing and joy and celebration and, and, and blessing generally. It's talking about the blood of Jesus. It's talking about the Holy Spirit who is the new wine, which are all really, really interesting things, but none of those are the point of the passage. And so often we get caught up in all that stuff, which is great, but it's not the point. Our job is to ask What is the point? Jesus, what are you saying to this guy? And what are you saying to this guy that applies to me that I can apply to my life? Here's the point. The Good Samaritan story, it's a story, by the way. You know, you get people getting the the details and that. What on earth was that priest thinking? Why did he cross the road? Why couldn't have he? Why did he cross right to the other side of the road and go around the guy? The priest didn't even exist. Don't worry about the priest. It's a story. He's a made-up character. Now, Jesus' words would have been full of meaning and everything else, but let's not overlook into it. The main point of the Good Samaritan is this. It's talking about salvation. The question was, how do I inherit eternal life? Jesus is answering the question with the story. Jesus answered the man's question already, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and your neighbour as yourself. And the guy, because he's a self-righteous dude, says, oh, okay. And Jesus says, do that. And then he goes, oh, yeah, but who's my neighbour? You can just hear the tone in it, eh? Oh, you can say, who's my neighbour? Jesus says, well, I'll just carry on answering the question, who's my neighbour? And that's what the Good Samaritan's about. I don't know how many of you have ever read it from that perspective, but it actually sends a very, very powerful message to us in that. But here is the problem. If we cannot embrace the bad news or recognise the bad news, we cannot embrace the good news. If we cannot understand the bad news, The good news doesn't actually mean anything to us. The bad news in the Good Samaritan is that this dude, this expert of law is lost. But he's so self-righteous and pious and thinks he knows it all that he doesn't know he's lost. And he doesn't get the point that he's lost right through the passage. But the fact is that he's lost. He's so lost that he doesn't hear the good news. If we can't understand our position that without God we are lost, the gospel actually means nothing to us. It's only when I discover that I am lost, that I am broken, that I'm separated from God, at that point the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ becomes really, really, really good news. But until the time that I realise I'm actually lost without Him, it doesn't matter because I don't see it for what it is. That's what the Scripture says. You know, they see but they don't see. They hear, but they don't hear. And we pray that our eyes would be open and our ears. Jesus said, taught in parables and only those who were spiritually alive could see and hear what he was saying. Most people, it just went straight over their heads because it wasn't yet their time. But Jesus is positioning this and it's just going straight over this guy's head. My prayer is that our eyes are open, our ears are hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying because this is an incredible scripture And it's about salvation. Jesus' point to the expert is that you can do all you want and try as hard as you can, but you cannot live up to the requirements of the law. That's what he's saying. He said, you can love 
your neighbour like this. You can bandage his wounds. You can um, put him in a hotel. You can do these things. Even then, or he says actually, then you'll be saved. But the thing is to do that consistently. How many of us here could afford, just practically, could afford to stop by every person we saw with a need? You see someone that's broken and homeless. How many of us could afford to put them in the Novotel for two months? But, but it's not talking about once, it's talking about this is a consistent lifestyle. You just can't do it. It's impossible. Jesus is actually setting the bar, setting the bar so high here that the man, there's no way he can come up to that, even though he's not going to admit it because of his self-righteousness. But that's what he's doing. The story of the Good Samaritan is, is this. It's only by God's grace are you saved. Only by God's grace am I saved because if I try to do it according to my own strength and live according to the law, I come short. That's, that's uh, the bulk of the Bible is showing us that trying to do it by the law, we cannot do it. It just won't work. That's why we need Jesus. Jesus is the only one who's ever fulfilled the law. No one else. Not you, not me. And so it's this amazing picture of grace. But the guy doesn't get it. Because until we accept that without Jesus, we're lost. Until we accept that the only way to the Father is through the Son. Until we accept that I'm a sinner and I'm broken and because of my sin, because I'm part of humanity, I was disconnected from God. The good news means nothing. I think the challenge in the story for us is, am I standing in a place of self-righteousness where I'm not hearing and seeing the good news of God because I'm trying to justify my actions to get into relationship? You see, last week we talked about all. Love God with all. I talked about the glass being 12 mil empty. That was because it was about 12 mil from the top of the water if you were here and saw it. I got a great question during the week. Someone emailed me and, and said the challenge they were wrestling that sometimes they feel like they're loving God with all their heart and soul and strength and then something will happen and it just distracts their attention so suddenly they feel like they've got split loyalties and they're not coming up to welcome to life. Welcome to life. That's life. You, you and I can't love God all, all the time. We just, we're incapable of it. As good a goal as it is, and it is the goal, don't make the goal lower. The, the fact is that we come up short, but that's why the grace of God. If, if we didn't come up short, there is no need for the grace of God. But we come up short, we can't do it. We can't do it. We, so, so what happens is people like this, this religious uh, expert, he's trying to live from behaviour to earn his way into the kingdom or his way into heaven way into eternal life, and he's never, ever going to do it by his behaviour. But if we can understand the good news that I am saved by grace and then live from that position, loving the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength, the command doesn't change, but our position does. And by God's grace, it looks differently. Still make mistakes, all that stuff, that's right. But God's grace is God's grace. There is only one person that you can love even close to what the Scripture is saying. And that's yourself. All of us, most of us, will sow and invest into ourselves without sparing. But Jesus says, love your neighbour. As yourself. Who's my neighbour? Well, see, the, Jew, the Jewish expert, he's, he's fighting this because they weren't known to be nice people. They just weren't. They know, I mean, they, they didn't even love all the Jews. Most of these guys loved their own little group, their, their Pharisees or Sadducees or whatever, but they didn't love beyond there. So it's a really, he's, he's trying to catch Jesus with this dirty question, so who's my neighbour? And, and, and Jesus goes well beyond the fact of even just your Jewish people. He's, he's saying, essentially, everybody. So it's impossible to do what the Scripture says. Impossible. But by God's grace. 
Romans 3.21 says this, But now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. That's good news right there. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. The sacrifice shows that God was being fair when He held back and did not punish those who sinned in past times, for He was looking ahead and including them in what He would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate His righteousness, for He Himself is fair and just, and He declares sinners to be right in His sight when they believe in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the grace of God. It's all about the love of God. And that's what the Good Samaritan's about. There is no way you and I can measure up. Let's just settle that. That's the bad news. Until we accept that, there is no good news. Just got to land in that place and own it. As a human being, I belong to the human race. The human race made mistakes that separated us from the love of God. There is no way that I can correct that. Doesn't matter what I do, how good I am, doesn't matter what you do, how good you are, you cannot correct that. That is what it is. The results of that mean a lost eternity, separated from God. End of story. Out of your control, out of my control. That is the bad news. Can we just accept that? Yeah, that, that is what it is. According to Scripture, that is what it is. As soon as we accept that, accept that and own it, suddenly the good news is really, really, really good news. The grace of God is absolutely amazing, incredible, undeserved. It's a, it's a life changer. It's an eternity changer because it's, it's nothing to do with me. It's everything to do with and all I've got to do is believe. That is an unbelievable deal, surely. Particularly when I understand that state. It's an unbelievable deal. All I've got to do is believe in Him. Jesus Christ, make Him my Lord, my Saviour. Understand that He went to a cross on my behalf. And in doing all that, He paid the price for humanity's mistake. So that now when I believe in Him, the relationship is reconnected. That is good news. That is amazing news. But if we're standing in self-righteousness, we, we just don't get that. And that's where the religious leader finds himself, the religious expert. And standing in his good deeds, well, trying to trip Jesus up. You read in one of the other accounts, he says, I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, might. Well, no, he didn't. He might have thought he did, but no, he didn't. We fluctuate like the wind sometimes. The grace of God. The grace of God is the most incredible thing. Did you notice in the book of Romans that the grace of God, the salvation of God, extended to those past as well as what's happening in the present and the future? That's amazing. Yeah. It said God didn't judge those in the past because of what he was doing now. The salvation of God extends through all human history and eternity. It's an incredible thing. My prayer this morning is that something of the wonders of God's grace just penetrate our heart. Something of the wonders of God's love because we don't deserve it at all. He could have just wiped the planet started again. But no, something of his incredible love and grace and mercy persists with us because he loves us and his greatest desire is that we find him. It's an amazing thing. An amazing thing. I think the older I get, the less I get it. I think, talk about make it hard for yourself. But that's love. That's 
incredible divine love. So no one can live up to the required standard. We've all fallen short. But by God's grace. Can I ask you to bow your heads just for a moment? If you're here this morning and you've never ever said yes to Jesus, you've never said, I believe in you, Jesus, and I give my life to you. I'm glad you're here for a start. That's awesome. This morning, why not make this the time? The reality that we're lost without him. That stretches into all eternity. That's a scary thing. But by his grace, simply as we believe in him and what he did and give our lives into his hands, our confession that he is Lord. It not only changes this world, but it changes all of eternity for you. And that's incredible. Man, I look how cool this world is and it's broken. What's eternity going to be like when it's all fixed? It's going to be amazing. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand in just a minute if you want to say yes to Jesus today. I believe in you. First time giving your life to him. That's awesome. Maybe today, for whatever reason, you've been quite distant and you're going, boy, I've got to sort this out. Well, that's fantastic too. You know, the, the Good Samaritan speaks to another group of people. It speaks to the people who are in church and striving for salvation by what they do. I mean, this expert in religious law, he'd given his life to it. He'd given everything to it. And he'd been on the creative team. He'd been in kids' church. He'd served in youth. He was welcoming people. He was making coffee. He was leading activate. He was doing everything. And Jesus is saying to him, you don't get it. It's all about relationship with me. Those things are all good things and they flow out of relationship with me. But doing those things don't actually work when you brownie points with me. And maybe you hear this morning and go, man, I've been in church trying hard all my life. Today, can you say yes to Jesus? Because it's His grace that makes a difference. It's His love that makes a difference. It's His way of doing it. If you want to say yes to Jesus today, can you give me a quick wave? Just let me see your hand, wherever you are. Thank you, that's great. Just make sure I see your hand. three or four hands, that's great. Father, today we cut through the pretense. We're not going to get far trying to do this thing on our own. We acknowledge it's by your grace. And that salvation is in the name of Jesus and no other way. So today we choose you. Today we give our lives to you. and do it your way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. For the rest of us this morning, can we do a little bit of a attitude check? Are we standing in the box of self-righteousness hoping that we can pull this thing all together? 
Or are we standing in the realm of grace, which goes so much further than any of us could go and in a sense is an impossible realm, but it's His realm, it's God's realm. It's His provision for us. Just for a moment where your head's still bowed and eyes still closed, have a conversation with Jesus. Lord, what box am I in? And if I'm in the wrong one, please help me shift. If I'm stuck somewhere in between, by your grace, help me shift. Help me shift. Help me embrace all you are, Lord, and everything you've done. Understanding that there's no way I can do this in my own strength. It's just beyond me. But by your grace. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would rest on every person in this place. We acknowledge your grace is sufficient. And that your good news is the greatest news. Let this be a place of divine revelation this morning. Of your goodness and love and mercy and kindness. In our desperate need to engage with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.